Hi, everyone. Uh, it is my great uh, pleasure to uh, introduce Professor Manon Pignot, who is uh, visiting, visiting, uh, visiting us today from France as part of a World War I historian's tour organized by the French Embassy to commemorate the uh, centennial of the U.S. entry into World War I. Uh, so from November the 13th, yesterday, right, to November the 18th, five World War I scholars from France, uh, visiting seven U.S. universities, the University of Chicago, the Ohio State University, Boston University, Columbia, Park University, Georgetown, and the University of North Carolina, uh, where they will be presenting and discussing their research. So I'd like to thank the French Embassy, the French Consulate in Chicago, and the Mission du Centenaire in Paris for making this happen, and also the Merchant Center, its director, Professor Herman and the staff, especially Stephen Bladock and, and Catherine Becker for welcoming, welcoming us today. Um, Mano Pignot was yesterday at the University of Chicago and the Lycée Francais in Chicago. Tomorrow she will be in Georgetown. Um, so we are truly delighted to have her on campus today and tomorrow, this afternoon at the Mersion uh, Center and tomorrow morning in my graduate seminar on World War I. Professor Pignot is an associate professor uh, in the Department of History at the University of uh, Amiens, Jules Verne, and a junior member of the prestigious Institut Universitaire de France. She's one of the leading scholars on the history of childhood in wartime uh, and has published extensively on the topic. Among uh, many publications, I'd like to mention Allons Enfants de la Patrie, her first book, Génération Grande Guerre, published by Le Sein in 2012, and more recently, L'Enfant Soldat, published by Armand Collin, an edited volume on children in the 19th and 20th century. And also, she's also the author of a chapter on children in the Cambridge History of the First World War, edited by Jay Winter. Since her first book, um, this one, Allons Enfants de la Patrie, Professor Bignot has contributed to the field of history of children uh, and the field of World War I studies in general, at least in three different ways. First, I think, by presenting children not only as victims of war uh, and victims of war violence, but also as actors, actors in the process of, of totalization uh, of war in the 20th century. Second, by addressing the issue of gender and the issue of gender roles, um, by presenting the difference between young boys and young girls, and most studies of children in what time tended to focus too much on young boys, and you've shown clearly the importance of, of young girls also in, in what time. And finally, by exploring uh, children's drawings as a new source for the history of childhood in what time. In our talk today, she will be presenting a new research project on teenagers and teen competence in 1914-1918, a topic too often neglected by the students of of World War One, so please join me in welcoming Professor Manon Pidio to the Ohio State University and to the Mersion Center. Thank you so much, Manon. Thank you, merci beaucoup, Bruno. Uh, Bruno and I, we are very old friends, so it's, it's quite funny for me to hear him calling me Professor Pignot. <laughs> it's like, ooh, am I that old or what? Uh, but really, really, really happy to be here today with you. And I'd like to thank, uh, of course, the French Embassy, but also the Merchant Center for uh, welcoming me so well, and Bruno for all his efforts. So uh, in, uh, in an interview with the French newspaper uh, Le Monde, uh, published in uh, uh, 2010, uh, the Chadian filmmaker Mohamed Saleh Arun, speaking of his uh, latest film, Un homme qui crie, a man who, sh who shouts, uh, uh, this uh, filmmaker, Chadian filmmaker, evokes the African continent. And uh, this is what he said. It is Africa who inve invented street children and child soldiers. How did we manage to send children to war? And to me, and to many war historians, the real question would rather be, how did we come to believe that it was Africa that invented child soldiers? The child soldiers has indeed become an inescapable figure of the current war phenomenon. So therefore, there is uh, an absolute necessity for historians of youth and childhood, 
as well as for uh, historians of warfare, to uh, decompartmentalize, ooh, that's a tough word for me, <laughs> uh, the subject. I mean on a geographical level, not only Africa, and on a chronological level, not only today's nowadays. So uh, this is what I'm proposing today, an historical digression through the Great War that can be a way to put this phenomenon into perspective. Juvenile combatants of the Great War were simultaneously invisible and visible. They are most often invisible in the archives, but they are also uh, very present, visible in photographs. So this new research, which is still a, a work in progress, was born of this mysterious presence slash absence at a time when we think, but we are wrong, <laughs> we know and understand everything about the First World War. Furthermore, studying the juvenile combatants back in the past in Western countries and without the screen of anti-democratic regime can help to put the phenomenon into perspective and to give it more historicity. In other words, to understand that nor African countries, nor fascist or Nazi regime invent the child soldiers in the last decades. So let me give you some concrete material. No. Yes. No. Yes. No. OK. So who are they? these uh, juvenile combatants. I will explain later why I don't call them child soldiers, but I prefer teenagers, teen combatants, juvenile combatants. <laughs> there are three uh, kinds of uh, teenage soldiers. The first one are the myth, the one who were killed in action, like Jean Corentin Carré in France. So they were killed during the war, and they became famous just after the war. Jean Corentin Carré in France, or, or no, Jack Cornwell in the UK. The second type uh, are the girls. They were not so numerous. But there were also a few girls, such as Marina Yurlova in Russia. Uh, Marina Yurlova, who was the daughter of a Cossack colonel and uh, she fought during the war, during all the wars since 1914 until uh, 1920 because she fought against, against the Germans first and the Turks, the Turks and then she fought against uh, the Soviets. Uh, and uh, in 1920 she went to Japan. Uh, uh, she, was, uh, she was wounded as you can see on the pictures and she went to Japan and from Japan she went to the United States, where she became, as you can see it, a, a glamorous dancer in Hollywood. But she wrote her memories, and uh, it's uh, entitled Cossack Girl, published in 1934, and it's amazing. And the third uh, group, it's all the others, anonymous, uh, from whom the only trace is a photograph, sometimes without any names, like this young Russian soldier in the trenches, these two, the three Russian war prisoners in Germany, and uh, the two pictures are coming from different kind of uh, uh, archives, uh, one from Nantes in France and the other one from London, the Imperial War Museum, and, uh, or this one, we have his name, Petit Pierre de Loss. Loss is near Lille in the north of France. 14 years old, three brisque. So the brisque are uh, the stripes on the, on the shoulder. And that says how long he has been on the front. So the first one is for the first year on the front. And the, the others is for the six months. So he's got three uh, stripes. That means two years on the front. The picture was te taken in 1916. That means he was on the front since 1914. So he was 12 at the beginning of the war. So as you can see, there is a, 
Some sources, but not so many, very fragile, very disseminated in the military archives, photographs archives, and personal memoirs. And uh, my, the method I, I, I try to use to reach these uh, juvenile combatants is uh, a mix between microhistory and uh, historical anthropology of juvenile engagement. So how many uh, of them were on the front? This is the big issue of statistic, uh, which is for a microhistorian a very big problem, as you may suppose. Um, apart my own statistics for France, there are former works, uh, the works, uh, Tim Cook's uh, works based on the War Grave Commission uh, in Canada, established at the end of the war, or the works of uh, Richard Bessel uh, for Germany using the Statistik Deutschen Reich published in 1922, and uh, both of them uh, give uh, pretty much the same idea. In reality, the difficulty is, isn't so much in finding uh, actual numerical data, which is a totally impossible task, but rather to establish an order of magnitude. Teen combatants obviously represented less than 1% one of, one of the troops, so that's pretty much nothing. But that represents... Uh, uh, thousand and thousand of teenagers uh, fighting from 12 to 16 years old on the front. And yet this, this, uh, their importance, notably in the, the popular memory, especially during the centennial, far exceeds their actual presence in the military machine. This is pretty much the same then with the impact of gas attacks on the memory of the Great War. Uh, because we know that uh, the actual lethality of gas attacks is nothing compared to uh, bombings. Uh, but uh, the, in, the, in the same way, I would say that the illegal recruitment of teenagers was highly symbolic. And it is what these enlistments represent that, it, that is at the heart of my inquiry. So how to name and define these juvenile combatants? I used to sum up this group in one sentence. I used to say they were too young to fight officially and legally as volunteers, but they were also too old to wait on the home front doing their bit as children. So the age group is uh, from uh, 13 to uh, 17 years old, uh, because the, the legal age for voluntary is, in most of the countries, 17 or 18 years old. So 13 to 17 is the period from the end of compulsory education to the legal age for voluntary enlistment in most of the Western countries. For psych psychologists, the period of adolescence, adolescence coincides with puberty. It is a time of blurred boundaries marking the passage from childhood to maturity. So the psychologists used to talk about the puberty transition. For us historians, we should rather refer to an adolescent transition which is also a cultural concept, as it is defined by a given society's system of representations. It is not therefore universal, as most anthropological and ethnological studies have shown. It is thus a deeply historical concept. So they are adolescents. And at this time, in this area, Europe, from uh, during the Great War, these young soldiers are adolescents. This is why we definitely should not name them child soldiers, because the term child soldiers would be a patent misnomer when uh, designating young, young people of 
intermediary age. Adolescents who took advantage of the ambiguity of their physical and social appearance to allow them to enlist. I, de I therefore prefer the expression teenage combatant, teen combatant or juvenile combatant to the widely overused child soldier. I think it comes closer to the reality of the particular experience of the Great War, which is the issue of juvenile combatants agency. The second aspect of the conceptual definitions of adolescence is its ambivalence. The French uh, sociologist uh, Edgar Morin has shown that two tendencies intersect in teen culture. One toward integration, the other towards disintegration. In more historical terms, we might call these practices of affiliation in one hand and practices of trans transgression in the other hand. So I will now uh, present you the different modes of enlistment of these uh, child soldiers. Uh, and the different uh, causes and meanings we can elaborate to explain these uh, enlistments in terms of filiation and transgressions. So, some of these uh, teenagers first try to get a legal enlistment and some of them used to write letters to uh, military officers to ask for legal enlistment. La has this young H.J. Palmer, uh, 12 years old, to a recruiting officer in, uh, uh, in the UK in uh, 1915. Uh, I must I must carry on the work my father has begun. I'm 12 and a quarter years of age. Will you please do your best to procure me a position as a drummer or burglar in any regiment, etc., etc., etc. Of course, uh, I found a lot of letters like this. They have no chance. And the answer is always, no, please go back to your mama. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> but no. So the, the only way for, for them is to uh, run away from home. I'm not sure I'm... Oh, yes, this is another, another example of letters. I'm only a boy of 10, etc. Uh, so run, run away from home, trying not to be catched by police or, in France, gendarmerie lying about their age, lying about their name, identity, in order to get in the train. Uh, some of them managed to reach the front, but were uh, caught up there and so discharged. So at the Imperial War Museum archives, there is there are a lot, a lot of these discharge certificates uh, quoting having made a misstatement as to age on enlistment. And uh, we can find, we can see uh, how long it, it took uh, the officers to uh, identify these uh, uh, illegal uh, soldiers. Sometimes it's like five days and sometimes like this one is like uh, 122 days after serving uh, 122 days, so that's, uh, uh, that's a lot of, uh, of time, three months, uh, before being uh, identified. But a minority managed to reach the front and to stay. Uh, and in those cases, they are uh, welcomed and even protected by soldiers and uh, non-commissioned officers. So uh, this is what we call in French un secret de polichinelle. That means uh, it's hardly a secret. Everybody knows, in fact, that they are teenage soldiers, that they are teenagers 
on the front. But the question is, uh, why the soldiers, the adults, the officers, uh, choose not to uh, denounce them and choose to keep them with, with them, to keep the, the boys, the teenagers, with them. So uh, a few examples of this presence uh, protected by the men. So this one is in French, so maybe I will skip to the other, which is in English, unless you can read French. Uh, le gosse qui suit notre bataillon, etc., etc. No. No. Okay, I will come later to another example in, in English, sorry. So, let's try to interrogate the causes, the meanings of these uh, uh, departures to the front. The first cause was, for some teenagers, the financial one. Tim Cook, who has studied, who was the first historian to study teenage soldiers for, the, for Canada uh, 10 years ago, uh, Tim, Tim Cook quotes, the appeal of the salary was not negligible for a young person without personal resources. Uh, but what is true for Canada uh, is not for France, where the pay is very low and far from what a young worker could earn in war factories, for instance. So the first cause is financial, but I don't think it is the main cause. The second cause is uh, the, the patriotic enthusiasm, especially at the beginning of the war. The third cause would be what we can call the impulsiveness of youth, the unconsciousness. And what strikes me the most is the last cause, the, the pursuit of adventure and violence. What I would point as a, a thirst for war. So now I would like to summarize a, a little bit my arguments and interrogate how we can interpret this thirst for war. So there are two different but yet complementary interpretations. The first one is to interpret the illegal enlistment as a transgression, uh, as uh, one expression beyond others of the pubertal transition. This is the pursuit of adventure. And in fact, that's true that in a lot of uh, uh, recollections, oral or manuscript recollections of these former teen soldiers, we can find this, I this idea of uh, war as an adventure, uh, like in uh, these uh, private Edwards memories when he writes, the whole idea of war thrilled me, the glamour and the romance of it. Uh, in the same idea, uh, Marina Yurlova, the, the Russian Cossack girl I told you about before, uh, made a real odyssey across Russia. Uh, in blue, I'm sorry, this is absolutely not 2.0 <laughs> modern way of mapping things. I do it with my hands and my pencil. <laughs> I'm old. <laughs> Sorry, but as you can see, in blue, it's the period of the First World War when she was fighting uh, the Germans and the Turkish army. So it's quite uh, uh, limited to the Caucasus. So from Kuban to uh, Baku, crossing Erevan, Tbilisi, and uh, Tabriz. And uh, after uh, 1917, when she was wounded, uh, she was uh, evacuated to Moscow and then begins her very long trip uh, to uh, uh, finally 
finished in the United States, but she didn't know at the beginning. So Moscow, Kazan, Zlatut, Omsk, Tomsk, Irkutsk, Harbin, and then Vladivostok, and in Vladivostok she took the boat to Japan. So this is really an odyssey. This is an adventure. Um, running away to join the front constitutes a triple transgression, a symbolic and uh, a an symbolic one with the rejection of parental authority, a legal one with the manifestation of unlawfulness and vagrancy, and finally a social and economic one with regard to the family's equilibrium, which is necessarily upset by the enlistee's departure and search for a degree of financial autonomy. So the decision to join up is most often made in opposition to the wishes of fathers and mothers. In these cases, enlistment can be seen as what we call in French un passage à l'acte, an acting out, as would say uh, psychology. But there is also a second interpretation that would be to seek the filiation behind the uh, transgression. Ah, mais il est là, lui. Sorry, it was uh, wrong. Still for the thirst for war, seeking for adventure and seeking for violence. This is the example of Noël Vaché, illegally enlisted at 14 years old in 1940. And he was, when he explained, he, he wrote his memories uh, his souvenir just after the war 1920, when he was at the hospital, Cochin in Paris, and his, uh, so his memoirs are quite, his souvenirs are, are quite fresh at this moment, and he's uh, describing the pleasure uh, to, uh, to join the front and to, to hear the sounds of war. Uh, and he describes how impatient he is to, I quote, know the war at last. So, sorry. The second interpretation would be to seek, as I said, the filiation behind the transgression. The impact of patriotism and war culture must be interrogated. Enlistment can be also a way to honor the fatherland and the fathers. And uh, uh, Jean Corentin Carré, who is the, the most famous uh, teen soldier in France, uh, uh, explained it uh, clearly in a letter he wrote in uh, 1970. Jean Corentin Carré uh, enlisted illegally in uh, 1915, when he was 15. Uh, using a false name, uh, uh, and uh, when he reached the age of 17, he asked to uh, re-enlist under his uh, true name, and he was uh, he, he joined the the aviation. Bruno, comment dit l'aviation? Air Force, thank you, in 1918, and, and uh, his, uh, his plane was, uh, was shot and he died in 1918. But this is what he, he wrote to his uh, school teacher, uh, Monsieur Maizeb, and uh, as you can see, uh, the impact of patriotism and war culture is very important in his desire to engage, enlist, uh, and to reach the front. Uh, another sign, another sign of uh, filiation behind the apparent transgression of uh, teenage soldiers is also um, uh, the importance of filial ties that exist between uh, these teenagers and the adults, the male soldiers on the front. Uh, 
ador adolescent enlistment, teenagers enlistment fits into a subtle networks of filial ties, the relationships forged with men on the front, recruiters, uh, non-commissioned officers, sometimes officers, clearly show the existence of surrogate paternal, paternal figures. Uh, this is also an integral part of the adolescent period from a psychoanalytical point of view. As a uh, Gérard Mandel, I don't think you know Gérard Mandel because it's quite an old book, 1969, but it's a very important book when you work on youth and the issue of generations. Gérard Mandel wrote in 1969 a book uh, titled La crise des générations, the generations crisis. You see the period 1969 just after 1968. So, he was not talking about war, of course, he was talking about mai 68. But he's thinking of uh, this issue of generations and of relationship between the generations. And this is what uh, Gérard Mandel wrote. In the conflict of generations, adolescents do not decline their inheritance, but rather want to inherit immediately. In, uh, in historical terms, we might speak of a form of membership or compliance with the war effort at the expense of parental or paternal instruction. So, if we can analyze uh, underage enlistment as un passage à l'acte, an acting out, we should also analyze it as a uh, rite of passage, a uh, rite de passage as described since, since 1909 by uh, Van Genep. Anthropology has described the three steps of the rite of passage as separation, the first step, margin, the second step, and then aggregation, the third step. So, uh, therefore, in the case of teen combatants, juvenile combatants, we can find a lot of practices that fit with these three steps. Separation from the family, from the mother especially, but also from the father, by changing identity, uh, lying about their age, etc., uh, running away from home, um, joining a group of older males, getting their protection, and uh, passing through tests of manliness like baptism by fire, alcohol, sexuality. That means that juvenile combatants' experience would therefore be a way to reinstate rituals of masculinity from which industrial and urban societies has ended up excluding adolescents during the 19th century. In the pictures, in the photographs, there are a lot of photographs with only the teenage soldiers, but there are also lots of photographs where the, the teen combatant, the juvenile combatant, is just in the middle of the crowd of soldiers. Here, Russian troops in Marseille, but also here. You see what I mean when I say secret de polichinelle. Nobody can imagine that that guy is 18, right? <laughs> he looks, like my, he looks my, like my older son, so. And another example of this uh, protection and complicity of male soldier, adults towards uh, young soldiers, this amazing letter uh, written by Colonel 
uh, Lloyd, and uh, I found it in the uh, British archives, uh, responding to a mother who uh, claimed for her son as being underage in 1916, July 1916, that means just in the middle of Bataille de la Somme, just at the beginning of Bataille de la Somme, and you know how uh, deadly was this battle. Mrs. Evans, I reply to your letter of uh, 11 July. I know your son quite well, as he often does work as messenger, etc. And he's quite an exceptionally intelligent man. I am astonished to hear that he's so young. He looks up to the standards of 19 or 20. I can hardly think that he ought to be discharged as underage, being so physically big and strong. The rule is that if the man or boy is up to the work, he stays, whether he is underage or not. This is absolutely not the rule. Never. I should be very sorry if anything happened to him, you bet, so during the Battle of the Somme. Anyhow, he has come through our part of the big battle, all right, though about uh, trois quarts, three, I don't know how to say in English, of the battalion, we are knocked out, so we have that much to be thankful for. Sincerely, Colonel Lloyd. Can you imagine the reaction of the mother when she received that letter in July 1916? But it's, for me, a proof among others that even if now we are discovering these teenage soldiers. It was absolutely not a secret at the time, and it was quite uh, voluntarily that uh, some of the men, some of the soldiers, some of the officers accept them, but also keep them to the front, because the presence of teenagers gave some sense, some superior sense to the fight. So to conclude, uh, I will ask uh, how we can fo follow uh, uh, the path of teen combatants after the war. Which posterity did they get? The best known, as I said at the beginning of this uh, talk, uh, the best known are those who died in combat. So I spoke about uh, Jean Corentin Carré or Cornwall. This is uh, Désiré Bianco. He became a myth, just like a modern uh, uh, François Joseph Barra of the First World War. François Joseph Barra was a very young soldier of the revo Revolutionary Army uh, who died in the uh, uh, 1793. But uh, he's a, he's quite, uh, Désiré Bianco is quite a pure myth because except this statue, there is absolutely no archives about him. He was 12 years old. He came from Marseille, from a family from Italy, very poor workers' family. And he uh, enlisted in the Légion étrangère, where uh, as it is still the case today, they don't really ask for your identity papers to take you in the army. Uh, and uh, he became the myth because uh, he was shot in the Dardanelles uh, just after he, he got out of the boat. And uh, the, the memory, the collective memory, kept uh, the sentence Désiré Bianco might have have pronounced at the moment of his death, which was, en avant, vive la République, which is absolutely, certainly apocryph. Uh, just like uh, François Joseph Barra uh, in, uh, during the, the revolutionary times. But we have others, teen combatants, that we can follow after the war. This is the ones who have continued their career in the army. And maybe you heard about Ernest. He's my favorite, really. Ernest Rentmore, he was 12 years old when he enlisted in 1917, 12. He pretended he was 18. And he was sent to France and, 
and he fought during the First World War and then stayed in the army. He continued fighting up uh, until uh, Second World War and Korean War. And uh, after his uh, retirement, he wrote his memoirs and uh, published in 1956, and then he died. And his grave is still in Arlington Cemetery in uh, Washington. And uh, it's uh, written on it, youngest soldier to have served with American Expeditionary, Expeditionary Force in First World War, 12 years of age. Some teen combatants emerge from anonymity because of ulterior events. Christian Sarton du Jonchet, this one is not my favorite, but it's very interesting. He ran away, he was a runaway pupil in 1914. He enlisted in a uh, uh, um, colonial uh, regiment, Les Pays Algériens, because his father was a uh, colonel of this regiment. So he enlisted, is a, is a very rare case of uh, illegal enlistment with the support of his own father. It's uh, quite uh, uh, unusual in my corpus. Uh, but what made him uh, famous? Uh, it's uh, uh, that he is better known as the founder of La Phalange Africaine, the African Phalange, a unit created by the Vichy government in 1942 to oppose the landing of Allied troops in North Africa. He was considered as a collaborator and a traitor, and he was um, banished after war, and he died in clandestinity after second, the Second World War. So, we only have two pictures of Christian Sarton du Jonchet. The first one was published in 1914, December, in a very popular illustrated magazine named Le Miroir, and under the title Un Goumier de 14 ans, a colonial soldier of 14 years old. And the second, and th this is really the, the only two pictures we have of him, is a uh, uh, the, f the picture published in uh, 1943 in a very collaborationist uh, magazine, Signal. It was a French magazine, but entirely paid by uh, the, na the German uh, occupation in uh, North France. So this is Sarton du Jonchet. And all the others were sent back, all the other uh, teen combatants, were sent back to anonymity. And we can understand why. I know, I forgot, of course. Sorry, I missed this slide. Very important. <laughs> uh, uh, because this is the French case, but we have also quite numerous cases of former teen combatants who became French corps, fire corps after the First World War, during the 20s, and then became uh, Nazis officers uh, like Werner Best, uh, and notably uh, Rudolf Oes, who was, beyond other things, uh, among other things, uh, the chief commandant in Auschwitz. So all the others that we don't have that we can't, that we can't uh, seek the trace after the war, were sent back to anonymity. And we can understand why, because contrary to some individual memories of extraordinary little heroes, the pacifist context of the 20s and the 30s forbid the possibility of a collective memory. Uh, it was, in a way, impossible to uh, understand, to listen to this uh, teenager story of who uh, voluntarily uh, went to war when the whole pacifist uh, discourse during the 20s said, Yes, we went to war, but we didn't want to. We had to. They made us go to war, but we didn't want to. And with this 
uh, teenager, the problem is that nobody asked them to go. <laughs> they went by themselves. So this is why I think, uh, this is an hypothesis, but this is why this uh, Légion des Milles, which is an as uh, association uh, founded in uh, 1935 in France, La Légion des Milles, uh, who was supposed to regroup uh, the youngest fighters of the First World War, but she, uh, this association was a total failure. And one of my biggest uh, pride is that uh, I talked to Stefano Don Rosso, maybe you know, sorry, maybe you know him, he's a French historian, and he used to be my master, he's still my master. And uh, so uh, when I discovered this Légion des Milles, I went to Stefano Don Rosso and I said, oh, have you ever heard of this? And he said, never. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, good point for me. He never heard of it. But there is a reason, I think. <laughs> this is because it was impossible to uh, hear. It was uh, what we said in French, inaudible. Inaud inaudible? inaudible uh, at this time during the, the 20s and the 30s. So to conclude, um, our, our difficulty nowadays uh, to think the agency of juvenile combatants, and it is a real difficulty today for us, uh, for in France, for instance, we are now today uh, confront to several cases of teenagers, French teenagers, going to Syria to fight for uh, uh, Daesh. And you can see in the media, in the press, that how difficult it is to, just to think the possibility of uh, 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 teenagers' agency in that case. So our difficulty nowadays, nowadays leads us to postulate uh, a traumatic experience of these teenagers. Uh, and uh, in my former research upon children, I've shown that war experience was not necessarily traumatic, whereas grief experience is. But war experience is not necessarily a traumatic experience for children on the home front during the First World War. So the same question can be uh, uh, asked to teenage soldiers during the First World War. Is it uh, necessarily a traumatic experience? I don't have yet the answer, but I found a study in, a, uh, in Psychogeriatrix uh, Review published in the, published like 10 years ago, about a uh, German child soldier during the Second World War. And it's a very serious medical study uh, on trauma and post-traumatic stress symptoms in former German child soldiers of the Second World War. Uh, leads by, written by uh, uh, Professor Kuvert. And, on a sample of uh, 100 of former child soldiers, the study established that only 1.9% of the sample had, had suffered of PTSD. Whereas, at the same time, a similar study on war children, so non-combatants, teenagers and children on the home front, uh, another similar studies showed that for war children, a prevalence of 10.8 persons of PTSD manifestation. So anyway, of course we will never have such statistics studies for the First World War. This is totally unfair, but this is it. Uh, but at least we can ask the question and with a micro historical and anthropological historical anthropology method, we can try to approach the phenomenon. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Um, I'm struck by the fact that you're 
talking about individuals and individual initiatives. And when I think of adolescent rites of passage and also of adolescent violence, I think of something collective. So if you're talking about a village, mm -hmm. you know, they lead to la jeunesse and they organize dances and they organize charivari and violent things. Or if you're talking about the, you know, an industrial context, they go into the factory together, mm -hmm. they play football together mm -hmm. and so on. And then if you think, of course, about other wars, um, <laughs> you know, you think about football hooliganism mm -hmm. and how that connects to the Bosnian wars, or you think about how a lot of extremism today comes from really peer groups of youth who are influencing each other. So I'm wondering, mm. do you think the difference is, first of all, it could be your sources, like you see individuals, or maybe it could be that the First World War is different because the front is far away and collective action, I mean, for many people, well, for a lot of them, the front is somewhere mm. else, and so the collective mm. mobilization is more difficult. Or do you think there's something individualistic also that might have to do maybe with the class backgrounds of whom you're finding or their kinds of social aspirations, the connection of war to something like social mobility? Okay. Thank you very much for your question. Um, I think there are two reasons that um, uh, individuals uh, are so important and not collective uh, um, way. Uh, the first reason is, of course, the sources, as you said, and because of the method I decide to apply, which is micro-historical method, methodology. But I also think that even when uh, a, a little group of peers, of teenagers, try to enlist together, the there is a cat or what? <laughs> no? Oh, it's a baby, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> um, I hope you won't be traumat traumatized by this old subject. Um, yes, I think that uh, even if there were sometimes group of peers that didn't manage to stay together to reach the front. And the, it was uh, like, uh, like, like an obligation. They had to separate themselves because they had to pass through a lot of steps in order to get to the front. And anonymity and loneliness was uh, uh, some criteriums, criteria uh, important because you you are less visible if you're alone than if you are two, three, four, five teenagers in a, I don't know, in a railway station, for instance. It's easier to uh, sneak in a, sneak up, sneaking up in a, in a train uh, among soldiers if you're alone because you can hide yourself, put a coat on you, and that's all. But if you're two or three or four, it's more difficult. But in the archive, especially in the British archives, you can see that at the beginning they try to go all together, like in a peer uh, collective enlistment, uh, but they, they had to renounce. But, but in, the, in the case of the British Army, you don't think that it's simply related to the fact that the Kitchen's Army is built on this community yes. group, yeah, unless you have a mm -hmm. that's, that's the mm -hmm. kind of local mm -hmm. entity. Which but at the end, yeah. they, they were separated. You know, I um, know you gave the one example of the U.S. soldier who was 12 years old that died in service, but I'm interested if any research has been done on that. And I ask this because in my own situation, in 2002, I was getting prepared for my grandfather's 100th birthday. And what I found out was his discharge papers had his father's name on them. And when I did more research, I found out that he used his father's, um, yeah, at 15 years old, he used his father's draft card join the service. And um, so in the process of getting his discharge papers changed to his actual name, which was an unbelievable experience in the Washington bureaucracy, to finally have that change, I was told there were thousands of U.S. soldiers who went in with their father's draft card <coughs> in World War I. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if any research has been done on that or not. I never find them. 
this research, but maybe maybe they exist. But uh, really, the article from Tim Cook, the war historian, Canadian war historian, he was the the, the director of the War Museum in uh, Ottawa. He is still, I think, and Tim Cook. I think really it's the, the only scientific article uh, I found on the subject. There are lots of books uh, written by uh, journalists uh, about uh, these, especially in, uh, in the UK, about these uh, boy soldiers, but they are not, you know, uh, scientific. So they are not quoting their sources, their corpus, can't do anything with it. <laughs> Uh, when I think you use the U.S. soldier, I just happen to I just happen to know you know he had a specific denomination, a Methodist cross on his grave. I'm just thinking, did you know any religious affiliation play a role in their personal decisions? I would say not in the not in the cases I have studied. It uh, astonishingly, but no. Uh, when he was talking about uh, the the. Uh, teenage soldiers who were found out to have joined underage and they received a discharge. Do you happen to know if they were honorably discharged or if they received less than honorable discharges for whatever action they might have seen at that time? I don't know. I don't really know. Uh, what I know is that for, um, uh, for a British and uh, I suppose American, but British, Canadian uh, teenage soldier, when they were discovered and discharged, they were not immediately sent back, back home because it cost money. So they were kept in a special camp in Etaples. So there, is a, there, were, there was a very big uh, soldier camp in Etaples uh, in, the, in, in the Somme, but there is a special section for uh, teenagers uh, uh, where the officers were, for some of them, also underage soldiers, but nobody knows you know, at the time. And uh, so they were kept there until they were uh, sent back home if their family claimed from them or they were kept just to wait until they are 19, and then they can be properly enlisted. Um, I know you cited that there were several archives of discharge papers for mm -hmm. underage soldiers, but then you also said that some units integrated those teenagers and protected them. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering what your opinion is of like why some NCOs and officers decided to expose these teen combatants and why some of them decided to protect them in any room. Well, I'm, I'm not completely sure, but I'm, I think that uh, the discharge uh, occurs when the officer didn't know the teenage soldier before. So when the teenage soldier is integrated in a section inside the regiment with I don't know, like three, four, or five soldiers protecting him and a non-commissioned officer protecting him, most of the time the colonel just said, okay, I don't want to know, just keep an eye on him, I don't want to know. But if the teenage soldier managed to reach the front alone and without any protection in the trains or they can, he can be arrested at the, how do you say, when he get out of the train and then get discharged. This is my hypothesis. But. I was really interested by your reference to the web of relationships that supported them when they arrived on the front lines. And I was wondering if you think it makes sense to think of some of their support networks as surrogate maternal figures <coughs> as much as paternal figures. I'm thinking of the work by Michael Roper on emotional survival where he talks about men being mother figures yeah. to each other. And it, it makes sense to think of the gender boundaries blurring in those ways too. 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yes, uh, Michael Roper's uh, works on emotions and emotional relationships are very important. And I would say that that they are very really. Uh, for instance, for uh, Noel Vaché, I show show you where is he? Noel Noel Vaché. Uh, he, in a way, had the chance to have the same uh, officer during all the war, since the beginning, since the moment he went in the train. Uh, so at, at the beginning, in 1914, he was not an officer. It was a non-commissioned officer. He was Capitaine Touratier. And then Noël Vaché managed to stay with him, and they, they weren't killed, both of them, during all the war. So 1914, in 1915, they went in Champagne. In 1916, they went, they, they went uh, to Verdun, and they survived all the times. And then Capitaine Touratier became Lieutenant Touratier, and then he became Commandant Touratier, and so he came, he came in. And Noël Vaché, in a way, uh, stuck with him, and Touratier wanted him to stay with him. And it was really, really a uh, father-son relation. Uh, and uh, even at the end of the war in uh, 1918, where they are going in the, what they call the, the liberated uh, 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 province, so Alsace, Lorraine, etc., uh, Vaché has his uh, first uh, uh, sexual experiences with the uh, young ladies of Alsace, and then Touratier is still uh, keeping an eye on him, give him giving him some advices, and uh, just want to be sure that everything was okay, and uh, so really like a, like a father uh, to his son, really. in their countries. Um, obviously, like today, child soldier, the use of child soldiers is seen very negatively. Was there any sort of like public backlash against the use of teenage combatants back then? Or is that something that happened later? Um, there, there was a, a public debate in the UK uh, after 1916 uh, uh, to ask for a more uh, strict um, uh, recruiting procedures, uh, and but uh, uh, it was really a, I think, a minority, and I didn't find anything like this in France, for instance, or uh, or in Germany. Uh, I think this is really there is a there is a shift, you know, like mentality where totally different. I've seen this about uh, children, not teenagers, but children. Today, you know, I don't know, I have children. When I turn on the radio and there is something about, I don't know, Syria or, okay, bombings, I say, okay, I turn off the radio because I don't want my kids to hear that. I prefer to tell, him, tell them myself. I don't want them to see or to hear some news. During the First World War, there, were, there was really uh, a will to uh, integrate children in war efforts, in war discourses. So this idea of protecting children against the war is absolutely a new one, and I think it, it's, uh, it, it has been built, well, since the, the, the Spanish Civil War in the op public opinion. But during the First World War, it was absolutely not a, a common uh, ID. So if it's true for children, it's true also for teenagers. And uh, we, we, we have to make, it's, it's a sort of effort, but mental effort to understand that uh, the society, the European societies of the First World War are still 19th century societies where uh, children work teenagers at work is normal. So for men, it's normal, it's usual to have kids or teenagers towards them and to keep them with, uh, to take them with them uh, to, to the front, okay? They take them to, uh, to work, they take them to the front. And in a way, the presence of teenagers is a symbol of, uh, of how uh, their fight 
is uh, fair and, uh, uh, and good in a way. I'm sorry, I, I didn't understand. Can you repeat, please? Yes, uh, the fatality rate for the soldiers in the French and the, and the British Army, hmm. did that have any impact on, on their uh, willingness to go to war in, in the 1940-41 when the Germans came back to attack? That's a tough question. Um, I don't think that uh, teenage teenagers enlistment had had any impact. The only impact is that these teenagers during the First World War fight again during the Second World War because they were also adults during the Second World War. Ah, d'accord, les pertes. I can't answer like widely about all European countries. I can answer for France. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I must remind you that in France there is conscription, so this is not a voluntary uh, enlistment, so the impact of the First World War uh, is not on the, the issue of enlisting or not enlisting. They don't have the choice in France. But there is a, clearly an impact, a sort of, I don't know, memorial impact, uh, that's what I say all the time to my students in, in France. We cannot really understand what the exodus of May and June 1940, the, the, the magnitude of this exodus, if we forgot that there has been an exodus before during uh, August 1914, for instance. Uh, in uh, 1940, uh, there were 8 million of French people on the roads uh, uh, running away from uh, the uh, German army, uh, eight millions, that's enormous. But uh, these people w uh, had live, lived the First World War. And most of the adults were children or teenagers <laughs> during the First World War. And they remember all the rumors, the myth, but also the real war crimes uh, committed during uh, the uh, the months of August 1914. And this is, in a more uh, political level, this is the same reason that we cannot understand the, the relief uh, that uh, French population uh, um, expressed when uh, uh, Philippe Pétain became uh, the last uh, prime minister of the Republic in June uh, 1940. Uh, it's, again, not only because he had this career. It's, of course, because he was the symbol of the First World War, but also of the pretendious victory of Verdun. And uh, again, uh, adults of uh, 30 years old, 35 years old, 40 years old, in 1940, they were children during the First World War. And they lived the war, and they lived all so, and they, yes, that's up pretty much what I can say. Maybe two last questions. Yes, Kim. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm noticing that in the first World War, there's now more of an attempt to return, you know, young um, child soldiers to return home to their families. I'm wondering if this increased concern, obviously it's less of a concern than in the present, is, is due to uh, the growth of, of the national state and perhaps changing relationship between uh, the citizen of the state. I, I ask this because I look at um, previous wars, for example, like the U.S. Civil War, where um, there were actually attempts by the U.S. government to sort of forestall the process of returning um, young underage soldiers home. You know, part of the reason that the um, President Abraham Lincoln suspended the writ of habeas corpus 
was... Oh my God, you, you, so I'm sorry, but you're talking so fast, I don't understand a word. I'm sorry, I have to tell it. Okay, can you repeat slowly, please? Thank you. I'm making all the efforts I can, but like, it's really, it's trop rapide. Okay. <laughs> Um, these, these child soldiers, if it's because of the fact that the state is now more powerful in the early 20th century than it had been in the 19th century. Uh, my field is the U.S. Civil War, okay. where the U.S. government um, actively made it difficult for families to um, have their underage soldiers or child soldiers return to them. Do you okay. think it's because of state growth that they're trying to make this happen now, or is it for some other connection? Okay, let me just check with Bruno if I understand well. C'est ça, donc j'avais compris. Tout va bien. I think, and again I will uh, take the, the French example, but because you, you're talking about the, the U.S. Civil War, but in France during, uh, for instance, the, the war between France and Germany in, 19, in 1870, uh, there were children as well. Uh, there is uh, uh, indeed uh, a shift with these uh, um, democratic regime uh, during uh, the at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, this idea of, and I'm speaking about France here, uh, a republic, uh, a strong republic with very clear structures, with conscriptions, with a regular and official army where no children, no women should uh, uh, appear. So, uh, with the First World War, it's over with uh, officially child soldiers, but it's also over with the cantinières and all these women who, who used to follow the armies even during the, the 19th century. It's now over. So there is this idea of a new um, social state with social laws that protect uh, children, uh, that created school, etc., etc. So it's like social and uh, and uh, uh, social structures of uh, these new states. But this is not specific to the republic because in Germany this is the same uh, with a, a very structured uh, society and uh, school and college and uh, uh, gymnasium. Uh, for uh, for teenagers and associations, uh, school uh, no youth associations to encadre uh, uh, frame frame uh, the the children and the youth. So this is the paradox that uh, with all these efforts to take them away from war, they they didn't. So let me uh, rephrase this. The paradox is in those um, um, Western countries, European countries, uh, during the war, they all made a lot of uh, efforts to take the youth out of war. But at the same time, all these countries are building war discourses, uh, mobilization discourses that said, what do you do for your country? You have to participate to the war effort. You have to fight for your country at your own level. So for, for young children, fight for your country at your own level. That means be good at school, be good at home, uh, go, and, uh, go and doing, uh, I don't know, for girls, knitting for the soldiers. But for teenagers, uh, 14 years old, 15 years old, when they heard fight for your country at your own level, that means, okay, let's go fighting. 
But at the same time, the structure, the social structures of these new states says, no, no, you can't. And there are all the police system, the administrative system, the legal system that says, no, no, you have to go home, go back to your mama. I found this, this sentence in, a, in one of my archives. Thank you guys for coming, but please go back to your mother. So this is, this is the paradox, and that opened a very tiny space between the effort the war effort and the social effort to take them apart. And in this tiny space, a few teenagers manage to sneak out and to get to the front. Thank you. Now, please join me in thanking.